welcome you guys. Thanks for coming on the show with me. It feels like a reunion of friends in a way, even though we've just met each other online, but I've had conversations with you, Jonathan and Cord individually and some of them very personal. It's exciting to me to see this comic that I've heard about for a couple of years now. I think I even now. <laughs> I think I even kind of talked about it on my really stupid YouTube uh, series called Brew Crew, where I was like critiquing your work cord um, mm -hmm. before I even met you. But anyway, we're here and you guys have a comic and it's on Indiegogo and it's doing really well. Welcome, you guys. I, I really appreciate you spending some time with me. Yeah, I, we, we both, I think, Cord, both Cord and I really appreciate the, the help you've given, just advice and uh also, as a model, you know, for sure, mm -hmm. I, we kind of followed you as a model in terms of how to do this independent publishing thing, how to how to do a graphic novel, you know, on our own. And so um, and even in terms of pacing, I feel like I was I was looking at Cord's uh, pacing and I, I was like, oh, for sure, Jason, there's like an influence of Jason, this kind of building up slowly and taking time to really just kind of indulge in the imagery and the and the, the scenes. And I, I felt like there was a lot of that in the way that cord was drawing so so for sure yeah. we're really happy to be here with you i was pleasantly surprised when i was looking at cord's work early on because there's a lot of people who want to make comics and they come and say hey, how do i do this and it's just like well you gotta draw for a long time probably to get to that next level you know learn to tell stories there's just so many hats to learn you know but um it with cord stuff it was really, it felt like you've already been put in a lot of time and the level of your work was already at a certain level. And so it just seemed like this would be actually a comic I would want to buy. Not just, you know, a comic that some guy made that it's kind of well drawn, but it's, it's really well drawn. It's really well executed in, in my opinion. So, uh, and then obviously I'm a big fan of yours, Jonathan. So when I saw the, that, uh, the merging of comics and your symbolism mentality, uh, it was really exciting. Oh, and one thing too, I got to say, Jonathan, we in one of our conversations, you you mentioned the story of of the dog headed saint, and and I looked it up. I didn't know you were making a comic about it, but I looked it up and I bought a little book about it. I was like, that would make a great comic. I'm gonna do that. <laughs> and then, to and then you it. announced that it was about that, and I was like, dang it. Okay, well, I'm not gonna step on his toes. <laughs> it's so funny that you're saying that because all the time while we were working on this, both the movie, my brother and I, when we wrote it at, at the outset, and while while Cord was working on it, on it, I could see online the awareness of Saint Christopher grow, partly mm -hmm. because of my fault because I wrote a, an article about it in 2013, mm -hmm. and so all of a sudden, like all these images started to appear, and I saw like even uh, science fiction type art, uh, artists would make versions of it, and it was. Google Images had more and more versions, and I thought, oh man, there's something's gonna come before ours. Like if we're not careful. Well, you you did it. So, so we did it. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about why comics. Why did you uh, venture into comic books versus just a, a more traditional route or writing a prose book? You know. Well, on my own, I thought I always thought I was gonna be a comic artist when I was younger. You know, when I was a teenager, that's what I was kind of gearing up to being. And then life took a different turn and my own talent took a different turn, I guess. Uh, but when I thought of the idea at the outset, it's a long time ago, like in 20, 2005, I think is when I thought of it first. It it was at a time when there were all these movies that were coming out, like uh, what was it? What was it called? Stigmata and then Constantine. There are all these movies that were using Christian imagery, using kind of this kind of mythological, biblical or Christian world, but they were really odd and twisting it and kind of subversive and stuff. And so I thought, and so I had this idea of like a buddy movie of like St. George and St. Christopher, above a buddy comic, like a team up comic of two kind of superheroes that were fighting monsters together, but it was like these saints. And I thought it would be kind of funny and, 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 and ridiculous. Uh, but then it grew on me and I'm like, wait a minute, this is actually could be a pretty good idea, you know, in terms of a, an actual story. Um, so I started thinking about it as a comic. And uh, when my brother got on board, we said like, OK, let's just let's just try for a movie instead. But we were super naive. Like, obviously, you can't make a movie out of this, especially as it grows. Like for now, it's it's OK, like in this first book. But as it goes, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you know. Um, and so when the movie idea kind of fell through and we we had it. 
we had it requested by some Hollywood studios and we had a little bit of traction, but at some point we realized this is, we're super naive to think this could happen. Um, and then we started thinking about, hey, we was a comic in the first place. Why not do make it as a comic again? And so that's how we kind of started looking for artists. And at the outset, like nobody knew who I was. And so it was hard to get even people to read the script. Uh, but with Jordan Peterson's uh, kindness, like enough people knew about me so that I could convince Cord to, to read the script. And so that was a <laughs> yeah. pretty lucky thing. That's cool. And Cord, you followed Jordan Peterson first, and then that's what you mm -hmm. discovered, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I was uh, following Jordan Peterson, especially his biblical stuff. And I was in the middle of doing a kind of a research comic idea that I had trying to lay out all of his ideas uh, in a kind of a comic form. And I was... I had some questions about some patterns I was noticing in Genesis. So I reached out to Jonathan and just asked him some questions. Uh, and then he said, well, I have a story you might want to work on in the future, you know? And then I, I just kind of put that in my back pocket, saved it for later. And I started going crazy with this research comic. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. So I put that down and reached out to Jonathan and said, let's talk about that, that big book idea that you had. So. And it's funny because I had seen, I went to Cord's website because he, he wrote me and said, I'm an artist, I'm doing these comics. And he kind of sent me what he was doing with Jordan Peterson, which which I didn't think was great. Like I, it was it was okay. But then on his website, he had a few pages where he did very short stories. It was like uh, he was doing Jimi Hendrix uh, lyrics, but in a kind of fantastical setting. It was, and but when I saw it, it was just like two pages each. But what I could see is that his his capacity for layout and his capacity for composition and of and of flow in the in the storytelling. Was I thought I was like wow this is this is definitely professional level like this is definitely great uh, and so I, I I intuited that he could maybe do this just from those four pages or whatever that I saw mm -hmm. and Cord tell me tell us a little bit about yourself how long have you been working at art and trying to get into art like what's your what's your mm -hmm. path here is this your first comic is this this is my first this is my first big project uh big so project. you know like like most people i grew up trying to tell stories with pictures and words most people who do this stuff i mean um in high school i really wanted to go into hand-drawn animation so i studied that a lot but i just kind of went back and forth between that and comics um but i always was stuck on big ideas i could never write short stories and jason you were an influence on on me for that because you were one of the first people that said it's okay to invest your time in a big story if that's all you can really sink your teeth into, you know? Yeah. Um, and then it just kind of fell into place that this big story that felt really important and special to me kind of landed in my lap. So I jumped at the opportunity. And are you, um, have you moved? I, I don't know if I yes. should ask this. No, yeah, you, yeah. You've moved yeah. and I know we were talking about that. Should I move out of this place? And yeah. how do I pursue art full time and all this stuff? So yeah, so I yeah. Take it things have gone to another level. Yeah. Yeah, things are <laughs> good. Things are happening. Uh, we'll see where it, where it goes, but I'm just taking it day by day. You know. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And I'm sure the the funding through the Kickstarter is very um, exciting to see that there's there's actually the funding there to keep keep this thing going. Yeah, yeah. Which well, yeah, it's definitely reassuring to see that people are getting behind it, and also like the number of backers that are willing to put their money into this is is exciting because we have yeah. that as a core. You know, yeah. and so if we put the book out and we end up uh, publish, publish, publishing some version on Amazon or, you know, in in a regular way, then it's exciting to know we have this crew that's there that can that is kind of our base, you know. Yeah. 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 When, when when did you start your YouTube channel? Yeah, 2017, I guess. <laughs> See, like wow. That's, Time that's goes just, fast, huh? Yeah. It's going fast. And but your the growth of your channel has been really fast too. Are you finding that it's a strange subject that so many people are into? Um, icon carving and symbolism and the stuff that you specialize in? Well, I think that the whole I the whole icon carving thing for me is a little apart from from the YouTube videos, you know. I I think yeah. a lot of people watch my YouTube videos and don't even know that I'm an icon carver, probably, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, and so the, but I knew, like my brother and I, Mathieu, who wrote the the script for for God's Dog with me, we've known for years that culture was moving in a certain direction where at some point the ideas that we were thinking about would become relevant. We didn't know how it was going to happen. We didn't know what was going to happen, but we knew it it was going to happen because it felt like 
modernity was unwinding. Even 20 years ago, we could see that modernity was unwinding and that a lot of elements were kind of breaking apart. And so, so when, when I met Jordan Peterson, I guess, and he kind of just said, okay, here's a stage for you, Jonathan, why don't you take it? That's what happened. Basically. Okay. Like, so okay. He- he introduced you to the YouTube. He idea. basically introduced me to the world in a way because he invited me on his channel while he was becoming famous, mm-hmm. and uh, and then he started. We did a tour together at the outset before he was uber famous. We did a tour. We did like went to Toronto, to Van- to Vancouver, to Seattle. We spoke together in different in different uh, places, and so that kind of put me on the spot. And so I thought, okay, well, this is the opportunity, you know. And my brother was writing his book at that time, and so it all kind of came together. We published his book and I was doing the YouTube channel. So I'm I'm really excited. And it feels in a way that, how can I say this? Like I'm running, we're running a race, like because the things we're talking about, I think are important. Um, and as the world fragments and starts to collapse in different ways in terms of our narratives, in terms of the inner struggle that people have in terms of politics, in terms of identities, all of this is going on. You know, we, we really feel like the symbolic way of seeing the world is a way to help people, uh, kind of make sense of what's going on. So, And I remember, I think it was one of our last conversations we were talking about how, but it was based on one of your videos where you were saying the world's, when the world's upside down, telling a story that is right side up seems upside down to the world. And that's kind of all you're doing. You're just retelling an old story that's just normal. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's shocking to everybody. It's shocking to everybody. <laughs> And so, but the, the, what's interesting about this story, like the, the character, especially the character of Christopher, in a way, he's a monster that finds his place, but remains a monster to a certain extent. And so it's also, it's also kind of understanding the place of the freak and the place of the monster and the place of the exceptions, because those are important parts of the, of the world. Like they're just a part of the world, just that we don't know how to do it anymore. We just don't know how to integrate these things properly. And so that's what the story is basically about. You know, it's like this monster that encounters, let's say civilization at, at a, at a single level. And then it grows into a cosmic level. And it's like, what do we do? How do we deal with this? What are the advantages of this brute? And what are the dangers, you know, and on the same side from the side of the dog man, it's like, you know, what are the advantage of me joining with these, this, this civilization, like, what can I, what, what is good for me, but what is dangerous to me as well? So it's like, it's basically the entire story is a, is a negotiation about how to fit in, how, when, when, when is it best not to fit in, you know, and all of that is what's going on. So. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And based on, you know, you're saying that is the timing is right and you're seeing the world kind of fracture and crumble in a lot of ways. And, the story that you wrote, you're you're seeing the world almost catch up to it, right? Um, based on the story, um, where do you think the future of the world is going? <laughs> uh, well, uh, right now, I think what the best way to understand it, uh, and I tweeted about this just yesterday, and uh, I guess it was the first time I formulated to people as clearly, it's what we're going to see is the end of the carnival. That's what's, okay. that's what's happening. And so for the past 30 years, maybe more, you know, we've basically been in an increasing carnival where mm-hmm. everything about, you know, about the, the going into the chaos of the this turning world of pleasures and of excess and of exaggeration and of freaks and of and of exceptions, you know, and of breaking down societal norms. Mm-hmm. It's been the it's been what has been fueling culture, let's say, for the past several decades. Yeah. Um, and now we've reached the, we've kind of reached the the summit of that or the the the, the most intense level of that. And and what's coming next is like the it's the end of carnival. It's the it's it's a clampdown. And mm-hmm. I've been saying this for, for a few years now, but now it's becoming clearer and clearer that that's what's going on. It's hard to know what that exactly is going to look like, but for yeah. sure the COVID measures and the COVID culture is part of it is part of seeing how things are clamping down seriously um but it's there's going to be more of that and uh huh. that's what yeah, i see that's interesting so if anyone is watching this and you don't don't know what jonathan's <laughs> saying about the carnival he has a youtube video or probably a whole series of them but um i'll try to link to a youtube video where he discusses the idea of the carnival i'm not trying to get you to be like a prophet here but like 
Are you talking? Are you talking like five years, ten years? Things are going so fast. Things are going and changing fast. so quickly now yeah. that I can see it being just like just collapse and crumble. And but how was you know? I I don't know. I guess I'm asking the wrong questions because this is about you guys making an awesome comic. <laughs> 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 I think look I let's say it this way like the 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 comic is really about what's going on and it's you know it's it mm. but it it's an, an it's an adventure comic it's not at all philosophical there's not a bunch it's not about people explaining things it really is a a, a conflict that happens between these giants these be, these monsters and the the let's say civilization and yeah. so but the, in that conflict you get a sense of what's going on now and the problem of civilization, but also the problem of breaking away from it, what all of that entails, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and it's crouched in a, it's crouched in a way that we're using the, let's say the Christian worldview or the Bible Christian Jewish worldview as a, as, as world building. So it's basically a mythological setting. So it's, it's similar. If you think of swamp thing, or if you think of, of, uh, you know, the way that even, let's say, Season of Myths, like how Neil Gaiman did Season of Myths, how he sets up, he uses Milton's, uh, he uses Milton's poem as a, uh, as a structure for, in, for a, word, a world building for a story. So that's kind of what we're doing, but we're using, so we're using kind of all these legends, Christian legends as a, as a cosmos in which to, to tell our story, you know? Okay. So it's, it's like, a, it, we're kind of pushing it because, it was like Tolkien did it. Like Tolkien did this world building that everybody now is basing their world on, but it was like totally fantastical. And then what we started seeing in like the nineties and the early two thousands was a, a weird Christian world building, but what, but was twisting it like kind of upside down, like weird. Mm -hmm. uh, like mm -hmm. Alan Moore was the best one. That's what he did it with Constantine and Swamp Thing. Um, and uh, there's a few people that were doing that. And so now what we're trying to do is to kind of flip that back where we're actually going to go back into that world, you know, and, and allude to a lot of the same types of legends that let's say Hellboy is alluding to, but do it in a way that is celebratory rather than just cynical and kind of, uh, yeah. Like yeah. some people come yeah. close, you know, but like, yeah. I think Mignola sometimes comes close where he seems to like those stories, yeah. uh, but it's always kind of, uh, it's always twisty and, and there's yeah. something, oh, there's also something really weirdly materialistic about it, you know? Yeah. It's like as yeah. if you have so much holy water, you can defeat so many vampires, right? If you yeah. have to put holy water in a bullet, then you can shoot it. And, it, and so yeah. it's, it's like this weird materialism that, yeah. that is kind of joined with uh, with these traditions. Uh, and so hopefully we're, we're going to kind of go back into that type of stuff, but do it in a way that is less, uh, less cynical. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Do you think it's going to offend people because it's so less cynical it's almost like you got to be cynical to not offend people now <laughs> yeah i don't know yeah. how people are going to i don't know how people are going to react to the type of storytelling that we're saying because it's it's good i think it's going to surprise people because it's 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 going to be how can i say this it's also not naive like it's not okay, a kind yeah. it's not naive at all like there is there is like a there are twists and turns and surprises in it even in the type of story, even in the way that we use, for example, like the St. George legend, we, we kind of turn it and we do the same with the St. Christopher story. We turn it, but we're not doing it in a way to, to like cynically destroy it. We're doing it in a way to, at the end for you to have a surprise and kind of, you know, not a negative. I don't know what you think, Cord. Yeah. You, you're, you, I wrote it. So I, I don't, I'm not objective about, about the story. So. No, I, uh, I don't know. I have a lot of thoughts going through my head about that. Um, but I don't think that people, would be offended by this story just right off the bat unless they specifically you know brought their kind of political offended lens to it because it like a like a tolkien story it just it's deep enough that it rings true further down in your heart than up in your head that likes to argue with things you know what i mean so it's a story that can be enjoyed loved and followed um before you start thinking about all the things that could possibly offend you yeah, that's so. right. I mean, that's how I mean, I people it. are offended by orcs right now. So it's like, what are you going to do at some point? <laughs> yeah. it's like people are super offended at Tolkien right now. So, well, it's like, so I was thinking of like underground comics, you know, and in the kind of seventies and eighties after the comics code authority clamped down, 
the underground produced the opposite of that, right? So then you had like Crumb and, and all these guys doing kind of smutty stuff, but in the background, you know? And now that this kind of like cynicism and wokeism has clamped down on comics and media, I think the underground again will produce opposites of that, where it's just like, you're going to have guys hiding in their seedy basement writing stories about saints and heroes and damsels yeah. in distress and, you know, things like that. Like, now that Superman is stories. gay, yeah, you, <laughs> everyone, you, you coming out of the closet by saying I'm straight. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not so. just Superman, right? Like Superman and Robin <laughs> is bisexual and and uh, I like it's just nonstop. Yeah. So now the freaks of the world are going to write a comic book about uh, just a regular marriage that's yeah. kind of eventless. That crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, or yeah, or just a hero, like a, yeah. like a hero that kind of saves saves the saves the day, you know? Yeah, yeah. Not I want to make a story. comic called Super Gay, and it's this really muscly straight <laughs> man who's just happy. <laughs> and then he he's also a superhero. It would really be really be you know unique. <laughs> I'm sure so, I'm sure it would really be it would it would be good for you there to do that. It would be uh, yeah. just wonderful. Uh, I might I'm you might have to calculate the pros and cons before you do that. Just a little. I might have to calculate if I want to keep that into the interview. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so what kind of styles and influences were you influenced by Cord in the art side of this? Um, I've always been influenced by people who draw with strong graphic shapes and like a good use of black and white. So like Mignola, Jeff Smith, Alex Toth. Um, there are a lot of names that don't come to mind right now. But artistically, that's what I'm kind of pulling from. There's something about the 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 flow too. Like it really is like a storyboard. Like to me, it reads more, mm. it reads more like a like a storyboard than let's say something like 300, which is like it's these compressed panels with like a lot going on in 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 each mm. panel. It it's more like a it's more like a movie. Well, and how about the coloring too? Like I I know you hired a colorist to do it. I saw that I thought the colors were beautiful looking. Yeah, we're working with a colorist named Felipe. Uh, I think his his last name is Cartine, pronounced that way. Um, and we worked a little bit with him. He's a great digital painter. Uh, we worked to try to develop a style that's a little bit like the Dave Stewart, uh, you know, simplified color palettes yeah. uh, that are really rich and moody without using too much, you know. Yeah, um, without a bunch of lens great. flares and yeah, Photoshop yeah. tricks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's very. Yeah, good. I didn't want that. I really struggle with a lot of the modern superhero coloring. It's just mm -hmm. so over the top, and there's something artificial about it. And yeah, that I really wanted to go back to a more tonal, flat, flat color with maybe two two tones, like a shade and a yeah. and a and a light in each uh, shape. And I think yeah. it's worked really well. And I think that that chord style works really well with that type of coloring too. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, the graphicness and then the simple colors like the Hellboy well just climb like like what Mike Mignola does with Hellboy. Yeah, similar to Mignola. It's just so it's just so striking. Like you can't you can't compete with that very much, you know? I mean yeah. Yeah, you can get crazy like I do sometimes with textures and paint and stuff, but you compare it and then sometimes, you know, the more simple it is, the 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 more striking it is. Mm. So. Yeah, but there are some scenes that I was really surprised to see that he also isn't trapped in a because sometimes I like I'll be honest, like sometimes I feel like the Hellboy and Mignola's coloring is almost too tonal. Like it's so tonal that sometimes it just feels like you're always in like a dark cave, like all the time. You're just con <laughs> you're just always in this dark cave. <laughs> but I, I thought that Philippe's uh, coloring, there are some scenes which are in daylight and kind of uh, there's boy it's there are boisterous scenes where you kind of feel this camaraderie between the people walking and there's this sense of. And in those scenes, you can feel that in the coloring where it's yeah. clear and there's more contrast. And so I'm really happy to see actually the diversity of, of, of approaches he's able to bring to the book. And how are, you're you're really close to being done or is it completely done? Is it just need to be the last page is colored? Yeah. So I have about six pages to ink, which okay. should be done in a week or so. And then just a, a little bit of coloring needs to be done and then the book compiled and uh, yeah, we're on track to finishing really soon. So, 
Sweet. And are you, um, do you have a printer? Do you need printer information? I can give you some stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We should talk after. I've got a few ideas, <laughs> okay. but I would, we can use all the advice we can get. Yeah, so. definitely. We're really looking forward to it. And also like, we're not sure what we're going to do with the, uh, with the fulfillment, okay. like how yes. we're going to do that. And so what's the best way to do it? So oh, man, so I, we, feel, we did, I feel we, the struggle. Oh man. So um, we're learning really fast. And, yeah. and you have the problem of being successful on the first campaign, and that's a real problem. I mean, if people don't understand that, like having a huge amount of backers all of a sudden on the first campaign, it's like there's a blessing in in having a small first campaign <laughs> because then you can make some mistakes and do the next one a little differently. A and I've done so yeah. many campaigns, and I still make mistakes and mess up cool. and so anyway. well, I know Cord watched a lot of videos of people like your videos and other people that were helping. And so one yeah. of the things we did was make sure that all the add-ons were like the size of the book mm -hmm. so that we mm -hmm. could just stack them onto each other and then put them in a bag and send them instead of having like posters that you need to roll up and yeah. you know, all these stuff that people add, but are like t-shirts and stuff that you have to ship separately and everything. And yeah. so we're hoping that that'll help in terms of fulfillment because we were that was yeah. worrying to us. Like when I see... I see some people like some of the like even um, Doug Tenapel, like he'd have to ship like a whole box, like these big yeah. boxes, you know, mm. and uh, man, it's, it's expensive. Mm. Stuff. Yeah. I'm curious how shipping and fulfillment is going to be. And uh, especially with how backed up things are, you know, in the ports. Um, so if you print them overseas, which I would I would suggest doing that. Um, and this is probably too technical for everyone watching. But if you print them overseas, then it might be a long time till you actually get the book. So I'd almost hire a fulfillment company like in the UK to, to uh, ship them out from there. Okay. You know, if you want to get them to people faster and it's a cheaper deal too, because you know, the, the price is baked into the, the book price when you ship it to you on a boat, you know, on a pallet, but then you ship anything overseas and you're spending a ton of money getting it back over there. Mm, yeah. You know, so um, I, I, I just keep losing my shirt every time I have a campaign because things keep changing so fast and shipping keeps going up. And so um, my next campaign, which I think I'm just going to print overseas, have it all fulfilled from the UK, hmm. even the domestic orders, you know, it will be a little higher than if I were to do media mail from my house, but literally no work for me other than sending in a list of names and money. And then they fulfill it from there, you know? So yeah. anyway, yeah, yeah. Super technical. Sorry, hmm. everyone watching. Everyone, yeah, um, but it, I mean, these are things we think about. Like, we yeah. this is the stuff we're thinking about right now. There's no, it's no joke. You know, we're yeah. and we're one of the things we want to experiment with. And it's like I don't know how it's gonna go, but I have all these people telling me like, you need to make an NFT. You need to make an NFT. And I didn't know what <laughs> NFTs were. Right? Well, none of us knew yeah. what it was. Yeah. But we kind of know what it was. It and it sounds really stupid at the outset when someone's telling you like, and if you like, what is it? <clears throat> Do you own something that you don't own? And I was like, what? <laughs> like, I didn't, I didn't understand this. So, uh, yeah. but there's enough people, I think, following me that are that are really into crypto and into the, the NFTs that we're going to try to find an NFT scheme, which makes sense to me or makes sense to us. Like, that's how I see it. Like something yeah. that is, that adds to the content and isn't just like, okay, now you own the book. And yeah. Like, I don't know exactly what that means. Like to try to find a way to add to the to the content, like have special editions and have even kind of we think about like secret keys to some of the hidden symbolism oh, yeah. in the book, that kind of stuff. Um, and with a, with like a degree of rarity. And so we're going to try that. And that's probably going to be either in December if we can pull it together or in uh, in January. So, OK, like they're mm -hmm. doing like Marvel and DC already started and mm -hmm. uh the results are are in like it's working. They're making tons of money, but they're yeah. they're not they're not publishing new content. Like they'll publish a you know like a number one of Fantastic Four or something, and yeah. then they'll make some rare versions, and then they'll make yeah. you know a million dollars selling it, <laughs> yeah, selling a just, comic that was published you know sixty yeah. years ago or whatever. Wow, it's so it's so confusing to try to figure it out. And I have all different friends doing different things with NFTs. You know, Doug Tenapel's making like ten thousand of something, <laughs> like individual. <laughs> nfts i'm like ah. and um anyway so it's it's a whole nother world i gotta wrap my head around but i'm, yeah. I'm tiptoeing into it uh, mm. because i i'm convinced not necessarily because of making tons of money and and like seeing what these artists are doing with selling collections but i'm convinced it's kind of 
NFTs with smart contracts through blockchain is kind of the way of the to sell digital like access to things. Like imagine if Amazon were to to have their books as NFTs, you would buy them, have them in your library, then you could resell them when you're done with them. You know, that's just a cool thing. And um, and as an artist, the artist could get a commission of that. Or imagine a movie that's going straight to Amazon Prime. All the artists get a percentage percentage of the NFT sales of that movie that is that's streaming. You know, that's cool. So yeah, it happens that's, automatically. That's, like it's it's, yeah. like, it's not it's not you don't need uh, people in between. So that's what's yeah. amazing. And then it has the resale value, and it, and then it can inflate collectability, and then the artist would still get paid part of that. So. <clears throat> Anyway, there's a huge world, I think, ahead of us. And it's, I think NFTs are going to, I think it's going to change everything. So I just don't know. I, I don't want to waste my time yet. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying I don't want to do it. I want to do it, but I don't know how to do it yet. So that's the thing. Know. And it's also like something, doing something that makes sense. Like, I don't mm -hmm. want to do something just to make money. That's like you said, like, that just mm -hmm. doesn't interest me. I mean, if yeah. I can make something which is, which makes sense to me, which makes people happy. Yeah. And adds to the value of what I'm doing, but yeah. I'm also making money off of it. Okay, all right, I'll do that. Yeah, you know, that's exactly. Fine. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's interesting. I'll be watching to see what you do with the NFTs. Then I didn't even know you were thinking about that. So, but <laughs> yeah, kind of forced well, you. What about um, the future comics? I know this is part one of well, how many parts? Two, three, four. Look, five. I don't know. We plan. Was it four that we planned or? Jonathan's original screenplay, uh, he sent it to me in like a, a screenplay script, and I broke it down into four books. But it sounds like Jonathan's got some new ideas. So, well, so Mathieu, my brother and I, when we wrote this, we were super naive about movie scripts, right? We didn't know what we were doing. Uh, and so we worked really hard for several years to get this screenplay in a screenplay form. Like that was that got recommended by uh, script scouting agencies and stuff. Uh, so we were super happy about that. But to do that, we had to cut out some amazing stuff, like stuff that that was really good and really enriched the storytelling. Um, and so now what we're hope, what we're thinking is that if the book does really well and people are happy about it and excited about it, then we might go back into the screenplay and then reintegrate some of the some of the streams that we had cut out and to make it so it would just make it more epic and you know more complexity, more characters, more character arcs. Uh, and more like a like a novel that has many characters with with different arcs and stuff. So that is possible. I'm not sure we're going to do it. It just really depends on how people react, how people, how much people want. And so, yeah. um, but it's possible to do that. Now, as far as the the story, like I got a little storybook version of of the story of Saint Christopher, right? And it, with the dog head. All that stuff, and I, I read it through, and I was when I was trying to make this as my graphic novel that you stole the idea from me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> are you combining? It sounded like you're combining multiple yeah. uh, saints, and so it's not just that story. Um, and so, and it's not even just the story of Saint Christopher. That is, yeah. so Saint Christopher is a dog-headed man, right? Mm -hmm. So there are many stories of dog-headed men in the ancient world. From okay. the legends of Alexander the Great up into the Middle Ages, there are all these legends about dog-headed men. There are also other legends of dog-headed men that either become saints or are with saints. Um, and so, for example, there's a very there's a there's a tradition of Saint Andrew who meets a monster, a dog-headed monster called Abominable. It's super fairy tale like. He meets this dog-headed monster called Abominable, who's a cannibal and a monster. And then Abominable converts, and now he's named Christian. So it's like, you know, it's a nice story about all of us, basically. But there are, there are other versions where some saints encounter these dog-headed men and then kind of convert them to Christianity, but then have them as like an army that they can unleash when they need to. And so it's like you basically have these monsters on your side that, yeah. that are nice with you, but that if you can turn and they can... They can yeah. go out, you know. And so we basically took all these traditions about dog-headed men, whether it's in in the, the, the actual story of St. Christopher or from other stories, and we kind of joined them into one character. Okay. So that's why you're going to see a lot of stuff that isn't necessarily there in the story of, of St. Christopher. But there's another mm -hmm. character, Mercurius, who also has dog-headed men in his story. So St. Mercurius. Um, okay. And so that's where we're, how we're doing it. So it's like... A, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, so it's much bigger than what I was thinking. Now, why dog-headed men? Like in history, what's what does this come from? What what's the reasoning for that? 
Do you know? Why why are there documented men? Well, yeah, I have my why? explanation for that. I mean, yeah, so it has to do with barbarians, basically. So the idea is that, okay, so every group, let's say any any tribe, any group, any civilization, they have their own center, right? They have their, their uh, the, in Greece, Greece, they had the belly button of the world, right? Delphi, they, they actually had a, a place which they considered to be the center of the world. And so that's where their identity comes from. And so as they move out, let's say you move out and then you encounter Persians and you're used to dealing with Persians. So they're strangers, but they're kind of like, you, you kind of recognize them. But as you move further and further, the further you move away from yourself, the less you're able to recognize what you're dealing with. And at some point, you're actually not able to recognize at all. So imagine, for example, a imagine, you know, like a Greek guy who meets someone from the Amazon that has a changed skull, like a stretched out skull and has their ears clipped and has their teeth filed and and has has tattoos, scarification all over their face. It's like the two cultures are so far from each other that you struggle to recognize the like what that is. You can't yeah. see it, right? There's legends. There are these stories that when the, the the native people in South America saw the the Spanish boats coming on the water, they couldn't see the boats. They would look out on the water. They couldn't see them because they were so far from their capacity to recognize something that they didn't register in their mind as an object. But this is, so it's, so there's an idea of something that is so far from you that appears to you as a monster. So it's really the idea of monstrosity itself, right? So a monster is always something that doesn't have a proper identity. It's a mix of this and that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, it's like this, but it's too big. It's like this, but it's too small. It's like, it's, it's a, you know, it's a fish, but it's, we don't know what it is, right? It's a, I don't know what it is. And so that's yeah. what the dog-headed men come from. It's like encountering something that you don't recognize. Um, but yeah. it's the dog, so because the dog is like, a, let's say, on the edge of humanity for our experience, right? It's the closest animal to us, you could say. Then that's where it comes from. Like the encounter with something which is human, but I don't know. Like, yeah. like imagine a Greek person seeing a gorilla for the first time. Like, is it a human? Yeah. Is it a is it an animal? I don't know. I need to figure this out. Like I need to I need to figure yeah. out what this thing is. It's related and to ex extraterrestrials too, like the idea of aliens in general. Mm. Like these monsters that are not like us, but we trying to figure out like are they dangerous? Are they helpful? Are they our friends? Are they our enemies? Are they better than us? Are they worse than us? It's like that's what you're trying to figure out when you encounter something you don't know. And so yeah. that's the idea I think of the dog headed men. Interesting. And because we're just, we're spoiled, we can see, get on the internet and see all kinds of cultures and all kinds of different things, ideas. So now we don't, we don't, you know, just travel on a boat. We don't have that experience. New. Yeah, we can have we it don't. auditorily. You can have it with sound, right? So when you, if I, like, if I hear, so I'm French and I speak English. If I hear yeah, Spanish, yeah. I feel like I'm with a cousin, right? It's like I, this, these people are my cousins because their language is close to mine. So it's yeah. like if I hear German a little less, maybe if I hear Russian, it's like I can't understand. Huh. And then I yeah, can yeah. make out tones, maybe. But like Cantonese, I don't even know if the person's angry or not. Like I can't tell <laughs> the tonality of their yeah. their words because it's so different from me. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. OK, that that makes sense. But it's just in a visual way. You're seeing yeah. dog headed men. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you can only describe as dog headed men. Yeah. And Jonathan described it a few ways, like a, like old medieval maps of the world as well, with like the center of the world being the, whatever that the center for that group was, um, you know, and eventually there's the, the cliche where past a certain point here, there be monsters, right? So there's monsters yeah. that past that edge, yeah. but between the, the monsters way out there and the people, there's that kind of buffer zone where it's the people that are like us, but they're like the monsters too. You know, and they're, kind of that, they're that hybrid right in between. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine layers of monsters, like bigger and bigger monsters that go yeah. out. And then there are monsters that are closer to us. They're dangerous to us, but they can also defend us from the bigger monsters. Like if you want to understand what a superhero is, that's what a superhero is. That's mm -hmm. what Superman is. He's an alien mm -hmm. who comes here, who's an alien, but defends us from other aliens. You know, all the superheroes are like that. Hellboy specifically. Because yeah. he's like he's like this demon 
creature who's on our side. And so he fights all the other demons for us, you know? Yeah. Wow. Well, what's the long, <laughs> what do you, what do you see for the future? Like, uh, is this the first of a bunch of projects in the graphic novel world for, for Jonathan and Corey? <laughs> I, I hope so. And it's not just me. It's like, I think one of the things like we're hoping to do in court, I think as well is we're hoping to inaugurate uh, a kind of, a different way of, of telling stories or how not different, but just let's say a way to, 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 to dive back into our legends and all stories and our fairy tales in a way that isn't, you know, like uh, right now it's so cynical. Everybody is, yeah. they, they're doing it. Right. Yeah. But, but uh, it's all cynical and upside down. It's always, you always have to, you have to twist the story. So we're, we're yeah. hoping to be able to tell, to go back into all these legends and fairy tales and stories and tell them in a sophisticated way, but not one which is always wanting to twist things upside down that is celebratory yeah. at the same time. And so yeah. it's similar. Like you can think about how the ancient Greeks would have different versions of their different myths that they would tell and that they would, that they would modify to make a certain point and stuff. Like this is something that I think could be really exciting. So that's what we're hoping. And then what that leads to, I don't know, but for sure we're in contact with, we're also kind of gathering around us people that we feel are good storytellers, good illustrators, good musicians. Like you're part of that, Jason, by the way, even if you don't know, good. like just kind of good. gathering good. people around to, to be able to, to want to participate in such a project, you know, yeah, uh, not necessarily all working for the same company or whatever, but ha having just projects that feed into each other and encourage yeah. each other. And, and uh, so that's what we're hoping for the future. That's really. cool. I really like that idea of, um, and I feel like this is the direction I'm kind of going more as I grow older is wanting to retell, um, certain certain stories no i mean i guess it's real similar to what you're doing but um i, I the first time I, I tried it was when i was hired by cave pictures publishing to do uh plato's cave uh the allegory and um you know i've heard it but i never really dove into it but i had to write a 12 page comic adaptation of plato's cave allegory and it was really enjoyable and P i keep getting emails still to this day saying that was really helpful. Like I was, we had to learn this for the, my class and I found your comic version of it. And it was, it was really, it tied it all together nicely. Um, and you know, there's, there's certain stories. I don't want to say which ones they are because then you'll ha I'll have the same problem you had, Jonathan. Well, still you're right. um, but there's, there's these really epic stories that I would love to see um, told in a digestible format where you don't have to be a, you know, you don't have to really be interested in re reading this giant ancient literature um, and decoding it and deconstructing it. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of a personal growth thing because I want to understand it too, but I also want other people to get it because it's like, if you just, re if you could just, read this thing like you would understand what's happening now you know stuff like that like yeah. mm -hmm. there's so many parallels with you know ancient stories that are happening right now and it would just be nice to just say this was written 2000 years ago already yeah. like you know yeah. here, here's, like, a, Neil, here's a Neil simple is going gaiman is went in this direction because he did he did the norse myths in a way that was just totally celebr celebratory like his norse myth norse myth book is great it's just a really yeah. good straightforward but humorous and kind of playful retelling of those stories um and you know of course he would do that because he of who he is but i yeah. think there are ways to tell medieval legends to tell the arthurian legend to, there are all these medieval legends that nobody knows about they don't yeah. even know they exist yeah. uh and so so for example like they did this version of sir gawain and the green knight now which is just really kind of dark and cynical and not, it's not great. It's whatever. It's okay, but huh. it's not amazing. But like you could tell that story in a graphic novel form, which would just be wonderful. Well, good. Well, yeah, I, I love the idea of, of trying to like retell important stories. I mean, why, why else were they written? You know, like <laughs> they're important. It's, it seems like a really important thing to, to be able to take these old stories and present them in a way that respects what was trying tried right. to be captured so long ago right and you can like i i think it's really the zeitgeist is there there's no joke yeah. i mean crumb did genesis 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's not as it's 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 crumb, but it's not as yeah. bad as you might. It's not as cynical as you might think. Yeah. He obviously yeah. revels in like the the let's say he revels in the more sexual and darker aspects of the Genesis, yeah. but he's still pretty faithful. He's actually very faithful. I think he just yeah. actually quotes. He just writes the biblical text and then illustrated mm-hmm. illustrates yeah. in comic form, which is like. I think the zeitgeist is is there for that kind of stuff. Where can we? Where can everybody go find your guys's work? Well, they can find it on Indiegogo, or you can just go to godsdog.com, which redirects to the campaign for now. Yeah. And Jonathan, you have a YouTube channel. Um, I'll put links to that in the YouTube video here. And Cord, where can we find you? Just through God's Dog, really. I've, I've kind of yeah, removed okay. myself from the internet in, in most, <laughs> except for interviews like this. But yeah, yeah. Uh, just happy to be here. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, thanks, you guys, for being on the show. Uh, I, I can't wait to get the book. I can't wait to devour it. And uh, I hope it grows and grows and grows. And and that you can make a movie out too. So I know that was what we that need was your one help. of the original ideas. We'll need we your need help, help David. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, the Coffee Table Comics production company is, is looking to acquire some uh, rights. Some IP. Uh, I'll, I'll send you a contract. <laughs> yeah. It'll be really cheap. <laughs>